Antonio Gramsci once said, the challenge of modernity is to live without illusions and without becoming disillusioned. In the contemporary society where man is losing touch with what makes him human, we need to shake ourselves into reality. Good morning. I would like to welcome you all to this talk series celebrating 100 years of Wasteland and Ulysses, hosted by the Department of English, University College. Today, we celebrate the centenary of these two works. James Joyce's Ulysses and T.S. Eliot's Wasteland are perhaps two of the most important literary works of the 20th century. Both of these works find a common ground in discussing modern civilization and man's place in it. The remarkable ideas expressed by in these works always draw literature enthusiasts like moths onto a flame. I would like to call upon Mrs. Pramina Thompson, head of the Department of English, to deliver the welcome address. Over to you, ma'am. Her honored guests of the day, Dr. Jansi James, Dr. Kalyani Vallabh, respected principal Dr. Saji Stephen, dear colleagues and students. We have gathered here today to celebrate the legacy of two momentous works of English literature. These two literary icons, T.S. Eliot and James Joyce, marshal the chaos of modernity into their chosen artistic forms. In The Wasteland, Eliot writes, these fragments I have showed against my ruins, mirroring the nature of his creation and the fractured reality of his times. Though his work sparked widespread controversy and was banned in the United Kingdom till 1936, James Joyce spends in his, as James Joyce spends in his Ulysses, a man of genius makes no mistakes. His errors are volitional and are the portals of discovery. A century later, students of literature still delve into these seminal works to unravel their significance, and it is indeed appropriate that we celebrate the centenary of their publication. We are fortunate to have with us today two eminent academics to guide us in this celebratory quest. Dr. Jansi James has served as Vice Chancellor of two universities, Central University and Mahatma Gandhi University but she is better known to our faculty members as a beloved former professor of the Institute of English. On behalf of the Department of English, University College, I extend a warm welcome to you, ma'am. <laughs> Dr. Kalyani Vallath is an educationist and publisher and is a well-known figure in the academic world. And I cordially welcome her on behalf of the department. Her father, Professor Balakrishnan Nair, a former principal of University College, has also graced us with his presence here today, and I welcome him also into our midst today. <laughs> our principal, Dr. Saji Stephen, has always encouraged the endeavors of our department, and I gladly welcome him into our midst today. I also extend a hearty welcome to all the teachers and students who are enthusiastic participants of today's event. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Our principal, Dr. Saji Stephen, has graced us with his presence and will now be giving the presidential address. Good morning, all. Respected guest of honor, Dr. Jan C. James, former Vice Chancellor of MG University and the Central University, who is inaugurating this seminar with the keynote address on the wasteland. Dr. Kalyani Vallath, eminent academician, educationist, and an authority in English literature, who is delivering the talk on Ulysses, former principal, Dr. Balakrishnan, head of the Department of English, Srimadhi Pramina Thompson, dear colleagues, and my dear students. The Department of English University College is celebrating the centenary of two great works of English literature in the 20th century. These works would have echoed many times in the classrooms of this college. 
which has celebrated its 150 years of excellence a few years back. Started in 1866 by Sri Aileen Tirinal Ramavarma Maharaja to impart English education to common folk of Travancore. The college has now grown into a center of excellence with 23 departments and about 4,000 students. The college is accredited with A grade by NAC and it is ranked 24th by National Infrastructure and Ranking Framework NIRF among colleges nationwide. The institution also continues to be in the first position of ranking in Kerala for the last consecutive four, five years. The Department of English, one of the major departments of this college has 22 faculties and most of them are research gates. Competitive examinations and research output from the, this department contribute, mu contribute much to the excellence of this institution. A galaxy of eminent personalities including the former president Dr. K. R. Narayanan were alumni of this department. A lot of programs are being organized by the Department of English to help research scholars and students in pursuit of research activities and studies. The discussion on James Joyce's novel Ulysses and T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland, which were the most important literary masterpieces of the first half of the 20th century, will be of great interest to these students. All of you will be able to explore the resemblances differences and relationship between the two works which were published in the same year 1922. I appreciate the organizing committee for the sincere efforts taken by them in arranging such a program. Hope all the students will actively participate in this seminar and make use of this opportunity in grabbing new information and ideas. I wish the program a grand success and thank you. Thank you, sir. I consider it my privilege to welcome the keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Jansi James. She is the former Vice Chancellor of both MG University and the Central University of Kerala. She will be delivering the inaugural address and talking to us about Wasteland, an elegy on the aridity of post-war mind. We are all looking forward to it, ma'am. Over to you. Dr. Saji Stephen, Principal of University College, Dr. Kalyani Malad, speaker on Ulysses of the day, Dr. Rajendran, my research scholar, um, who actually made it possible for me to be here with you today. And um, Dr. Srimadi Praveena Thompson, head of the department, and Dr. Balish Nair, who was the former principal of this uh, esteemed institution, members of the faculty, and uh, my dear students, friends. <clears throat> well, um, I think it's nearly more than 10 years since I stepped into this uh, campus. So <clears throat> I must uh, thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. I also would like to uh, congratulate University College English Department for conceiving this program and giving a thought to celebrate and commemorate um, what are the greatest events, happenings um, in literary history, namely the emergence of the wastelet in October 1922, authored by um, T.S. Eliot. Um, I'm sure that, you know, you must have got really intimidated by my carrying a file of papers, um, typical of a teacher. I enjoy teaching and I miss it. Um, for nine years when I was the Vice Chancellor, the only thing that I missed was actually the classroom. Um, I tried to go to the classroom and do some teaching in MG University, but I could not be a, a regular, you know, prompt teacher, so I stopped that also. So today we are uh, trying to remember um, the wastelet and Kalyani who is a wonderful academician and also a promoter of uh, literature all over the country, literary studies all over the country. She is my student too, I am proud to you know, um, say that. She is going to present before you Ulysses, 
another work which also was published in the same year, um, 1922. Even I was not born then. But when I did uh, for my MA, the bracelet, um, it was like, you know, uh, getting into a whirlpool or a whirlwind. Um, it absolutely, you know, shattered my so far existing literary sensibility and capability to appreciate literature. I began to understand that I need an entirely different yardstick, a different criteria to enjoy poetry, to understand poetry. Anyway, Eliot himself has said that genuine poetry would communicate before it is understood. And I think this is perhaps uh, the best statement on the wasteland also. And the connection between the wasteland and Ulysses, I'm sure Dr. Kalyani is going to mention that. Elite was aware of Ulysses, and Ulysses was being published in a journal, being serialized. And I think it got banned also. Um, because it talked about all kinds of things which were never thought of, and also the kind of presentation, the kind of imagism, the kind of expressionism, the kind of uh, surrealistic you know, representation of characters from myths and legends. Uh, Stephen Dedalus, which is already in the portrait of the artist as a young man. But the point is, Eliot was aware of it, and Eliot did take a lot from Ulysses, actually. Now, um, well, recently there was a uh, meeting organized by the Association of British Scholars, of which I am the, the president. It's, a, it's an organization of um, uh, those who have done their studies in Britain, in UK. So when I, it was, you know, just two weeks ago and the Queen is no more. So I asked uh, Ambassador T.P. Srinivasan to give a talk on, you know, and he sort of instantly, he gave the topic as London, London Bridge has fallen, but monarchy is intact. And I think uh, one statement on the wasteland is London Bridge is falling. It's actually an elegy on the London Bridge, which had already fallen. The London Bridge, as you know, is falling, is actually the code word for the, all the ceremonies and procedures attached to the Queen's uh, death and burial. That was the code word. They had prepared it, and, and the entire thing was prepared much earlier. So London Bridge is, a, is like a, you know, uh, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for so many things uh, in the English uh, scenario. It's also the nursery song that you perhaps learned, but I never learned because I had my pre-nursery, pre-primary education in, a, in an Ashan colony and wrote on sand my first letters, uh, taught by an Ashan, not by posh teachers, you know, like you did. So London Bridge is falling down, falling down, my fair lady, is a nursery rhyme. And in this particular poem, London Bridge stands for Europe, post-war Europe, post-first war Europe. It also stands for the unreal city as Valiate describes London. London as a kind of, you know, symbol of what can happen to the social fabric, what can happen to the human mind by the human, inhuman atrocities in a world war. Well, a thinker and a philosopher like Eliot, with, a, with, a, uh, with an amazingly you know, rare poetic sensibility, could not be, uh, uh, you know, could not be in a state of apathy uh, towards what had happened to the whole world, particularly Europe, uh, during the First World War. And the aftermath of the World War, what it meant to Europe. But you know, uh, uh, what you study as part of your curriculum, uh, this 433 lines long wasteland, that was not the original state of this poem. 
It was 800 lines long. And uh, Ezra Pound, the person who was also the, the propounder of imagism and modernism, he edited it. He got it from uh, uh, Eliot and reduced it to 433. And it's also interesting that uh, he wrote a few lines on this, you know. And to Ezra Pound, the poem was dedicated, as you know, to the better craftsman, it was dedicated. Ezra Pound, the better craftsman. And he wrote a few lines. If you must needs inquire, no diligent readers, that on each occasion, Ezra Pound, Ezra, performed the Caesarean operation. And that is how the wasteland was born. It is also important for us to, uh, you know, understand um, the poetic philosophy and poetic theory of uh, Eliot before, before we even open the lines. Um, we want to be become emotional when you write a, when you read a poem. You know? When you re write a poem also, the same happens. But Eliot believed and wrote again and again that poetic composition, indulgence in poetry is actually not an expression of personality or a turning loose of emotion, but an escape from personality and an escape from emotion. So this impersonalization of one's own self and one's own emotions when you write a poem, that was basic to his poetic philosophy. And he was also uh, very much concerned about, very much insistent on uh, taking the, you know, a different road. Uh, I took a different road and that has made all the difference, Robert Frost said. So, to be different from the existing mode of writing, the existing mode of artistic representation. Lots of things were happening, you know, from um, realism to impressionism. What you feel about reality is more important than what reality is and from into post-impressionism again, into expressionism, you can't just say, you know, clearly what you feel about anything. You have to say, you have to represent the inner reality of something. And to present an inner reality, you cannot be a realist. You can distort it. You can subvert it. You can make it ugly in order to bring out the beauty of something. Because the inner, the, the inner life of something animate or inanimate, is something which is beyond the grasp of, you know, ordinary, traditional sensibilities. So Eliot had spoken a lot about it, and he also, probably you have, you have already learned that, in his essay on metaphysical poets, he said, he talked about unification of sensibility, that you have to combine, you have to merge emotion, feeling, and thought. So just like, you know, a rose's flower, enters into your senses, into your sensory, you know, field. Thinking also should, you know, get into your, uh, you know, uh, mind and heart. So this yoking together of emotion and thought, which he felt, Eliot felt that the metaphysical poets had done, you know, in, in the 17th century. John Donne had done it. So John Donne compares uh, lovers to a pair of compasses. Um, that a husband and wife are like the two arms of a compass. But finally he will come back home, just like the arm of the compass. geometry there is geometry and there is also a love note and emotion. So this kind of yoking the intellect with the emotion. And Eliot went to the extent of saying that this Tennyson and Browning, you know, they were intellectual poets. But they were, they were not reflective poets. So he wanted to be a reflective poet. One who could reflect on knowledge, on information, on myth, on legend, on epic, on whatever past literature was. And at the same time, write about it in an impressionistic, expressionistic, imagist, symbolist, fragmented way, and at the same time, make himself communicated. He may not be understood, but he only wanted to be communicated. And he was also very much, you know, influenced by Melame, 
Baudelaire. So he said, to describe is to destroy, is to kill. So to suggest is to create. Turnile. So if you describe, teachers in a suchiganam, Yangaling in a describe even Nashipikim. You know, we spoil the beauty of all works by teaching, by explaining, explaining with reference to the context. Sandarpa Vivari Chashi and Vishadamake. So so that is actually killing the work. But to suggest Dhoni Pigya. Bharadiya Sahita Dilavanda. Dhoni. So all these, you know, um, philosophical, um, theoretical uh, convictions that he had went into this poem. And here there was a lot of emotion because personally speaking, he was in a he was in the worst of his you know life phase. He had married uh, Vivian, and within five years she became you know terribly sick, and they didn't know what to do. And in southern England, on the coast of Margate, when he was sitting, when he was spending the days with her, to see whether she would be cured out of the disease, you know. He wrote this poem, and that is why you have the lines, On Margate Sands, I can connect nothing with nothing. At the same time, he did not want to bring in, you know, his personal feelings and his personal, you know, emotions into the poem. So he yoked thought, he yoked the intellect with the sentiments, with emotion. And for that, he went into, you know, books like, you also know that, Unless I mention that, you know, uh, I won't be able to communicate. Uh, I'm not a poet, so I have to be a little, you know, explanatory. So he went into, you know, books like Jesse Weston's, uh, Jesse Weston's book, and um, From Ritual to Romance, and uh, Fraser's book, The Golden Door. So he made use of all these things. Because those books gave a uh, a whole world of legends, a whole world of possibilities in human experiences, in nature, possibilities in nature. So you have the Fisher King in the wasteland. I gave the title an elegy on the aridity of post-war human mind. Now aridity, sterility, drought, these are not new things in post-war world or <coughs> any time. <coughs> Throughout history this is happening. But in the legends, you know, often this kind of a dryness of the land, the physical dryness, the external dryness, the, the dryness or the infertility of nature, when nothing blooms and nothing, you know, fructifies, that is often connected to the doings or the nature or the character of the person who is ruling, who is in power. So if the king has gone wrong, if So we have it in our you know Indian uh, Puranas also. So we have the Fisher King, Ayla Fisher King in the period. He is one who fishes. And fish is a great symbol of you know rejuvenation and regeneration. Christ Bible in Palavrashu meem varatho odukunnu. Marichu when he was resurrected, you know, he came back and had food with his own disciples with fried fish. And anjappam undayayiram vere, anju meenum, anjappu. So fish is there even, you know, in the Bible. So fish is a, is a, is a symbol of rejuvenation. And here is Fisher King who is wounded on the genitals. Who, has, who is a wounded man? is fishing because he has to you know save his country it's a hope that by his transformation maybe by his death the country would be saved from the cursed infertility and drought so this this has been happening you know all over the you know i mean all through history and you have also a central narrator in the wasteland who is that elite Tiresias, yeah, Tiresias, the, the legendary hero. Tiresias is also uh, a very difficult person to understand. He also comes from the Greek legend. 
he's it says wrinkled man i mean old man with wrinkled breast so he has had two births or is he indian he happened to see um, a pair of snakes mating and he was cursed to become a woman but after this cursed period he again went back to the same scene and happened to see the same snakes mating again back to me so a person who has been blessed or cursed to have two uh, you know genders the masculine and the feminine very highly experienced person he claims but he is also a cursed person because he is a blind man he is a blind seer you know what seer is a, a philosopher a prophet so he is the one who witnesses this you know these happenings in the post war europe and you have also at least half a dozen shakespearean texts macbeth is there hamlet is there the tempest is there um, well uh, and more more of them which we can't even decode and we also know that you know um, uh, even if you don't know it is from the wasteland you know we quote many lines hurry please it's time and hurry please it's time actually is the kind of shouting that is done in english in british pubs pubile kada adakka raavum bo nammude kallu shopile pole thanne adakka raavum theerkada ezhudittu poda ennu parayunnathu pole hurry please it's time but this call in the wasteland a philosophical poem this call is to humanity please get away get out of this depraved condition in which you have lost the values of life in which you have lost your sense of morality in which you have lost love so love is a very important component in the wasteland and just as you have sterility infertility you have also sexual anarchy in the poem you know where women are being exploited and where a woman you know was husband has gone to the uh, gone to war and he is a soldier is going to come back and her friend is alert to her after all this man is coming back from war you better give him a good time and you look at the age of 31 you look like an old hag so why don't you at least get your teeth done or is it pudhiya pallengalum vechude and parayunnathu but she says i have had five children it was all difficult but and finally the six i had to use pills to get rid of it and after the pill taking i am miserable so you have again you have also the story of philemel philemel the kadhe ka kettundavallo so philemel and procne procne who was the wife of a king and philemel who was her sister philemel was sexually exploited nammal ippatha bhasha pariyane pidipikkapettu by the king and uh, he she shouted and she said she would you know narrate it to the world and you know what the king did the king cut off her tongue and then she wrote what happened to her as a picture and sent it to her sister who is the wife of the king and she was shocked she uh, she decided that you know she would take revenge so she killed the son that she born through him removed the head and cooked the fish cooked the flesh of the sun and later on showed him also the the head well this was you know very very gory kind of a thing and um, philemel getting changed into nightingale and procne into a sparrow and uh, the king into a hook so philemel becomes the voice of the endangered inflicted assaulted woman it could be post europe it could be 2022 it could be anywhere and she says sometimes she sometimes cries you know tirio and tirio is perhaps tirius the voice of the the the, the spoke voice of the poem itself but tirio actually she she actually you know um mutters this nightingale sings cha 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 as actually an alerting voice to those who think and 
uh, treat women, think of women and treat women, you know, unfairly and unjustly. But jag is also a word. Again, he uses the, the dialect, you know, uh, the slang. Jag is also a slang for uh, sexual act in British language. So those who do not understand the agony of the inflicted woman would only hear jag jag in this sense when Nightingale sings jag 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 cheerio. I can act because I was taught by a teacher, you know, who, as I said, made a big difference in my sensibility when he taught the wasteland. Well, the wasteland is actually first part, the, as you know, you've got five parts and the first part, the, the poem beginning with the, the, uh, the lines from the father of modern poetry, Chaucer, April A with its star of shoot, A, you, you know it, but it begins, April is the cruelest mind, breeding lilacs out of the deadland. Eliot subverts this happy lines, which is actually the beginning of, you know, Wasteland, the Chaucer's poem, Canterbury Tales. Why does he do that? When spring comes, we should be welcoming spring because it's the time of fertility, it's a time of flowering, it's a time of beauty. But Eliot says, no, beware, it's a cruelest month, breeding. A critic actually says, you should actually, you know, read it together. April is the cruelest mind, breeding. What is the outcome of the breeding now? Very bad uh, uh, breeding, very bad outcome. And mixing memory and desire, the memory of a dark past, the memory of inhumanity and desire which will never be fulfilled because as things stand, as the humanity prevails in post-war Europe, there is no hope that uh, the people, the society would ever change. London Bridge is fallen. The unreal city that London is, is not likely to be saved. There is no, you know, there is no salvation. So the first, you know, uh, uh, four parts actually give us very gloomy, dark picture of what actually, for, for this he uses, you know, symbols and images, the use of imagery is so revolutionary. And even the first lines, you know, the kind of motto like first lines, what do you want? The, 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 the disciples asked. And Sibyl of Kume says, I want to die. So that's the motto. That's again, that again takes us to, you know, uh, another uh, source where you have the suicidal impulse overtaking a person. She was a, 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 a Kume was actually a very learned lady, beautiful lady in Greek legend. But Apollo wanted to, you know, be her paramour. She said no. She rejected Apollo, God Apollo. So Apollo punished her. But at the same time, she was uh, given long life. Finally, she became so thin and thin and thin, finally became a, a voice, just a voice. So, and she's caged, she's put in a cage. She herself put, she put herself in a cage, one, one interpretation says. And when people come and ask her, what do you want? Because she's such a learned, you know, she was a learner. I want to die. Because that is the only thing that will not happen to her. So this desire and hope, which is almost no, minus in the post-war Europe. He presents all that, you know, in the, in the, in the first four. The first one, as you know, is uh, the, um, the burial of the dead, the burial of the dead, where, you know, um, everything needs to be killed. That's again another myth that we find in the legends that the evil has to be killed. It could be sometimes, you know, by throwing into water and the water will wash away, will wash away the dirt, wash away the immoral, wash away the undesirable, wash away the sins, the immoral. So this first part is the burial of the dead. It could be also killed by fire, could be burned down. So the destruction of the undesirable. The, the, the evil. The second one you have a game of chess which is again based on you know another poem. I, if I go into that I'll, I'll sound very much like a teacher. 
but it's again highly symbolic where you know uh, the the anarchy of i mean the sexual anarchy is is represented so touching so touchingly and as you know you know some of those uh, scenes uh, i said uh, eliot wanted to escape from personality and not let loose his emotion and personality but you see some of the scenes you know they are so picturesque for example the women who come and uh, the who are the daughters of the city directors who have been exploited by men who came on holiday came holiday and left without addresses that's a key line in the poem people who exploited these women maybe they have already become mothers but these people who spoiled them or burdened them would not even leave anything behind even in terms of an address so we have the picture of you know this kind of a situation you probably have have learned war poetry so you know what happened during the war time what happened to people what happened to women what happened to children and the third one you have the fire sermon which very much reminds us of buddha uh, buddhist you know principle and philosophy according to which indulgence asakti should give way to renunciation burn away your desires renunciation is the only way to salvation but he doesn't say that no hope he only talks about the burning process ellam katti chambalavaga the fire sermon it's a sermon because he quotes situations from history from legend where uh, people have been burned down where certain situations have been burned down because they are not relevant or they are not desirable anymore to be part of world history and then you have the death by water as i said could also be you know the in 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 fraser's book you have it in particularly in the egyptian legends you know you have this situation where the statues of gods are made and they are thrown into the water and this it will be you know swept away in a flow idonde irikum and when it comes to certain points of the river they will be retreat these statues will be retreat because water has purified these gods water has purified this situation in the country in that in the land so they gain this kind of rehabilitation this resurrection takes place that is death by water but he doesn't he doesn't talk about resurrection he only refers to these legendary situations indirectly and you have again the last one what the thunder said and what the thunder said is actually you know it is so it, it, it is so shattering because it actually repeats many of the things which has been said which have been said earlier but uh, as as i as i was you know uh, i thought i would begin with that but i think um, uh, i i left that there are so many quotations you know there are so many quotes in um, uh, the wasteland which people quote without knowing that it's from the wasteland or oh, i am in rats rally where the dead men have lost their bones is is again my nerves are bad tonight you know all these things we often hear chalpa chala naadagathile kee kekka adu wasteland aanu namukku arivu odu vayya so sweet thames run softly till i end my song ingane oru vaad oru vaad quotations undu and uh, um, one of the things most important is the last part of this poem what the thunder said after having spoken cynically and hopelessly about the failures of religion failures of all system political system administrative system governance christianity all religions he comes to a situation where he says i hear a thunder from the himavan from the himalayas tsa lit as you know he took his phd in philosophy that's again another story vali kashtam ada karyam karanam his father um, he is actually an american you know so his father actually wanted him to come back to america this boy, as a boy he went to paris sorbonne university i was there for some time uh, attending a conference you know 
that's a seat of uh, scholars and uh, thinking, intellectualism. I, I, the French intellectual uh, and the arrogance in the uh, seat and Sorbonne University. He studied there. Out of Pui and the Berg's name, Russell name, or Kabayanga Swadi Nathalai, philosophy lai. But his father thought that he would take a PhD from Harvard University, Harvard Land Registry. He'll come back and become an American citizen, but he didn't. He went to England and uh, Oxford in the PhD. And uh, he tried to, you know, again, he fell in love with Vivian, uh, an elite, you know, woman. And uh, father could not actually forgive him. So he tried to uh, appease and Father even did not mention his name in the will. Will patrati polem veer oru thilla. Eli attende. Karanam, he English guy arena, he nashichu hoya, he magane ortha. Ennum vedai le arena achcha. So that is the story of uh, you know uh, uh, Eliot's uh, personal story. He had learned Indian philosophy. So here at the end of the wasteland, you hear you Eliot listening to the thunder from Himalaya, and he thinks that. Perhaps the showers which would come at the end of this thunder might bring back, might restore the kind of values, restore the bonding between man and man, man and woman. man and man So woman and woman, man and man, man and woman, the human bonding, the value of love, it would be restored by the showers of blessing that might follow the thunder from Himavan. And what does the thunder say? Idhani jam parne palarade in prasanga thele. Idh palli lachchamari mori parai. Dattam, dayatto, dhammyada. So it's actually from Brahadar in the Upanishad. So Eliot hears these three things. Dattam, give, kodikaga. Manasarinu kodikaga. Ninna thanna kodikaga. Give yourself. Not only give what you have, give yourself, surrender yourself to the, to the needy, give. Dayatum, be compassionate, daya. And dhammida, control, discipline, control yourself, self-discipline. Apa idu, idu moonam kola ole. Apa idu achi maro, swami maro, aare mani idu biyorikim. But, when Eliot thinks that he has heard these three mandras from the thunder of Himalayas. I don't know. We don't know whether really he speaks what he means. There is Sopanamava. Maybe he attributes, he attributes this to Brihadarani Upanishad. A Christian, a person who has learned about the resurrection of Christ, who has believed that Christ still lives, who has said already in the poem that Christ, uh, uh, that Christianity has failed? Christ ne or vakshe or blasphemy bola parai na the hanged man na tungi chattavan. So that's blasphemy. That's the that's the most hurtful comment that you can make. And gal uh, 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 the the bleeding, you know, sweat bleeding in Gethsemane, in the Garden of Gethsemane by Christ because. He was pained by the ingratitude of the humanity for whom he was born on earth as a human. He distorted it. He had distorted it sufficiently to almost make us disbelievers in Christianity. And finally, this Christian poet comes out saying, Brihadara Upanishad gives you the answers. He went through Buddha, he went through all the legends, he went through, you know, all the Puranas and finally he settles. Does he settle? That's the question. Does he settle? Because later he himself became an Anglo-Catholic. He became, you know, uh, imperialist in politics and Catholic in religion. So we don't know whether, you know, this was a kind of, you know, philosophical or self-examining experimentation that he did. Aluj to Reflective poets do that. They just, you know, present before us the possibility. But what is important about Purtara, like, what is important? It's your time. I, I, I'm going into your time. But I'll, I'll stop soon. Um, 
the the point is you know this poem this poem it is not logically developed although i gave you this uh, as you you have it in the text five portions five five parts kendagilum uh, it's not a logically developed poem avasana me dattam daitam gamita en keer parna kadalasa kuda nammal oru twine ittu ketti angane irikkum alle oru kayar ittu ketti angane irikkum adu pole ketti kayyuma you can always claim it's an order sangathi sangathi orada thondallo actually um, eliot believed in this kind of a mode of writing and that is what he called objective correlative and in his criticism of hamlet ningal adakku padichittundavu maybe i'm repeating things that you already know but hamlet ne kurichulla pulliyada etto mari artistic failure aanu ornu shakespeare's hamlet because it does not have proper objective correlative um yan jeevikano marikano endakke ee hamlet ithrey engal nu karayan mathram karyam whether you know to be or not to be that's the question and like nammal ingane nadigayamayittu parayengilum athrayum illa prashna avade undayirunno or shakespeare has not succeeded in presenting the reasons the causes for that kind of a suicidal thought in the hero of the poem for that he said shirkum vendu the objective correlative he came came up with this theory he said you can you have you can present certain things certain premises for the finale of a happening of an experience in a work of art but presenting these things these objective truths this this realities these feelings in an objective way that he calls the objective correlative so that finally what you what the poet wants to evoke in the reader in the emotion at vendor hamlet to be or not to be endu parayumbodhekku enikku onnu maricha kolla ennu thonu you should feel that you know adalla bhayangaramayittu prema naadakam kandondirikkum oru prema oru love scene kandondirikkum enikku onnu premicha kolla allenge premikkina aalu onnu oorthu poguga engilalle idil artham ullu so emotion has to be evoked for that he said a formula he said the only way of expressing emotion in the form of art is by finding an objective correlative in other words what is objective correlative a set of objects a situation a chain of events which shall be the formula of that particular facts uh, for, for, for the formula of that particular emotion such that when the external facts which must terminate in sensory experience are given the emotion is immediately evoked apo tyrisius um philomel um fisher king um pub um lil ennu parayna robertinte viru prasavam kondu virubayaya bhariyum ivarokke buddhanum okke objective correlative so that finally eliot thinks that he has evoked in you the right emotion ad eligi eligi a kaanuna yan enu parnu vechada it's an eligi on the aridity the drought the sterility the infertility the dryness of the human mind angane avanam en eliot aagrahichirunnirikka but there is always the critical thinking that you know eliot could not actually convince us that datham daitham and damida are the answers to the questions that uh, that troubled him that vexed him in the post war european world athra dhairyayidu nalla parnadu ingane parnu adu avada undu aayirikka karanam mazhe urikkilum peyilla illa kettathu idiyunadam mathram idiyude avasanam mazha varumo mazha varatha idi nammal kettittundalle so it's actually there is a loosened there is a loosened and a loosened kettiyadava pinned ash van estate ediyapulum okay he claimed that you know christian faith is is a solution we don't know writers are funny that is why we read them so uh, I, i don't know whether uh, you know I, i was able to communicate what i told you i wanted to really uh, really you, uh, all that i want you to do is to uh, is to make you feel that enikku vaisnu nadu vaichu pattu onnu manasilavathilla padikkathavarkalla ningale ningale kayyorullanu i'm saying you know generally onnu manasilavilla pache 
മനസ്സിലായില്ലെങ്കിലും എന്തോ കാര്യമുണ്ട് എന്ന് തോന്നുന്നു ആൻഡ് ഏലി ടീലോ വാട്ട് ഇറ്റ് ഇറ്റ് ഹി ഗോട്ട് ദിസ് പോയം പബ്ലിഷ്ഡ് ഇൻ ദ ലിറ്ററി ക്രൈറ്റീരിയൻ വിച്ച് ഓസ് ഹിസ് ഓൺ പബ്ലിക്കേഷൻ പുള്ളിയുടെ തന്നെ ക്വാർട്ടേർലിയാണ് അതിനകത്ത് ആദ്യം ഇത് ഇറക്കിയത് ബട്ട് ഹി ഫെൽറ്റ് ഏതായാലും ഇത് വിചാരിച്ച പോലെ ഒന്നും ഹിറ്റ് ചെയ്യുന്നില്ല എന്ന് തോന്നിക്കൊണ്ട് ഓൾ ദ ദേവേഴ്സ് ഒത്തിരി ദേവേഴ്സ് ആർ ലോട്ട് ഓഫ് റൂറിങ് യു നോ കൈൻഡ് ഓഫ് വെരി ഹൈ അപ്രിസിയേഷൻ ബട്ട് ദ വാസ് ഓൾസോ ആസ് യൂഷ്വൽ ഐ മീൻ ആസ് ആസ് ക്യാൻ ബി ഇമാജിൻ യു നോ ലോട്ട് ഓഫ് ഓപ്പോസിഷൻ ഓൾസോ സി ഗോട്ട് ഇറ്റ് പബ്ലിഷ് എസ് എ ബുക്ക് ഫേബ്രൻ ഫേബ്രിലൊക്കെ ഇറക്കിയിട്ടുണ്ട് ന്യൂയോർക്കിൽ തന്നെ ആദ്യം ഇറക്കി വിത്ത് നോട്ട്സ് അത് അതിനേക്കാളും കുറവായി ബിക്കോസ് ഹി ബിക്കോസ് ദ നോട്ട്സ് ബിക്കം യു നോ സോ ഹെവി ഭയങ്കര ഒരു വല്ലാത്തൊരു നോട്ട്സ് and you know aipa panikar who was a teacher here who was my mentor and who was head of the department of instead of english a great poet modernism malayala malayala kavithayile kondu vanna he translated the wasteland into malayala how to print it ipo madhyamikara tharakkanda thonu so he also translated the notes also into malayala bhayangara uh, oru uh, it's so difficult because it is so and the linguistic untranslatability untranslatability cultural untranslatability okkeyulla oru sadhanam undu untranslatable but he did that you know you know why he did that because he understood that the language that he was writing was not the language that was used in india you know why he did that because probably you know he found in this western european consciousness and sensibility what he wanted to do in his own language in his own culture what elliot was trying to communicate was actually the the dissolution you know the the absolute uh, and the uh, disappearance and unwinding of all those good things in life truth belief faith um, love father child relationship husband wife relationship lovers relationship all these things were utterly changed elliot parna pole utterly changed but no beauty is born subversion eppozhum creative aayillengile it will be anarchy so eliot was addressing post europe world from this kind of a stance and oru pakshe enikkulla ee aavesham ningalkku oru vishayam thonnundavilla kaaranam ningal pinnide paipani ki saar kaynittu balayendran chullikadinde ka kavitha vaichittunde satchidananda kavitha vaichittunde they have all been you know highly influenced by wesley uh ts elliot so this kind of a seemingly fragmentary fragmented composition but essentially essentially winding binding resolving writing so we are now familiar with that but think of it you know at a time when uh, even to deviate from traditional mode of writing uh, was always questioned യൂണിസിൻ്റെ കാര്യം കല്യാ കല്യാണി പറയും എന്താ അതിൻ്റെ കഥ എന്ന് അങ്ങനെ നമുക്കെപ്പോഴും ഇത്രയും ഓപ്പോസിഷൻ തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും ഉറപ്പായിരുന്ന ഒരു സാധനം ഇങ്ങനെ ഇറക്കി എന്നുള്ളതാണ് ഇതിനെക്കുറിച്ച് ഇതിൻ്റെ ഏറ്റവും എന്താ പറയുന്നത് ഏറ്റവും ദ മോസ്റ്റ് ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻ്റ് തിങ് ആൻഡ് ഹീ ആക്ച്വലി യു നോ ഐ ടോക്ക് അബൌട്ട് ദ ഫ്രാഗ്മെൻറ്റഡ് നേച്ചർ ഈ ഒറിജിനൽ ടൈറ്റിൽ വാസ് ഹീ ഡൂ ദ പോലീസ് ഇൻ മെനി വോയ്സ് ചാൾസ് ഡിക്കൻസിൻ്റെ ഐ തിങ്ക് മ്യൂച്വൽ ഫ്രണ്ട് ആണ് or a novel a particular person uh, imitates the voice of different policemen aba adhe title adana idinu koduthirunnu he do the police in many voices endana he do the police in different voices because eliot tries to be the spokesperson of different personalities different you know persons from history from legend from puranas from epics but esra bond you know he is very cynical also esra bond is a what the how can you sell this this is such a stupid title the wasteland so 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 i could actually adondale enik ingine or title idan patti elegy on the aridity nokka parayan patten so although fragmented as i said although fragmented it's a very serious poem it's also a poem which goes beyond the times which is relevant if you read the poem carefully you will find that adinde agatha pala the the kind of situations which have been presented in this poem chalapa literally relevant to our own times we are a far far away culture alle nammala keralathile 
ഇപ്പം നമ്മളുടെ അന്ധവിശ്വാസങ്ങളെക്കുറിച്ചും ക്രിമിനാലിറ്റിയെക്കുറിച്ചൊക്കെ നമ്മൾ കേട്ട് മടുത്തു നമ്മളൊരുമാതിരി ആപ്പതി ഇൻഡിഫറൻ്റായി നമ്മളിപ്പം ചാനൽ വരികയാണെങ്കിൽ നമ്മൾ സെർഫി തിരിക്കാൻ മാത്രമായി പത്രത്തിലൊരു കോളം കണ്ടാൽ നമ്മളത് വായിക്കാതെ അത്രയ്ക്ക് സോ വാട്ട് എവർ പബ്ലെ ആണെങ്കിലും ലണ്ടൻ തെംസ് റിവറിൻ്റെ തീരത്ത് ഉപേക്ഷിച്ചു പോയ ഈ സിറ്റി ഡയറക്ടറുടെ ഇറസ്പോൺസിബിൾ ഉത്തരവാദിത്തമില്ലാത്ത തെമ്മാടികളായ ആമ്പിളരാണെങ്കിലും ഒക്കെ ഇപ്പോഴും നമ്മുടെ കൂടെ ഉണ്ട് ദർ ആൾ വിത്ത് എസ് സോ ദിസ് ഇറ്റേണൽ ദിസ് കൈൻഡ് ഓഫ് എൻ ഇൻഫിനിറ്റ് വാല്യൂ ഓഫ് ദിസ് പോയിൻ്റ് ദാറ്റ്സ് വാട്ട് ഐ വാട്ട് ഐ ട്രൈ ടു കമ്മ്യൂണിക്കേറ്റ് യു ആൻഡ് ഒരുപാട് വേറെ എന്താ ഒരുപാട് കാര്യങ്ങൾ ഇതിനെക്കുറിച്ച് പറയാനാവും ഇൻട്രസ്റ്റിംഗ്ലി ഇതാ ഞാൻ ഇന്നലെ കണ്ട ഒരു എസ്സയാണ് വിമൻ ആൻഡ് ദ വേസ്ലൻഡ് സ്ത്രീകളെക്കുറിച്ച് മാത്രം വേസ്ലൻഡിലെ സ്ത്രീകൾ സോ ഇനോ ഇറ്റ്സ് നോട്ട് ഓഫ് ഒരിക്കലും തീരാത്ത ഒരു 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 സ്റ്റഡിക്കുള്ളതാണ് പി എച്ച് ഡി തീസസ് ഒക്കെ ഒത്തിരി വന്നിട്ടില്ല ഇൻ 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 ഇൻസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂട്ട് ഓഫ് ഇംഗ്ലീഷ് സാറ മോഗി ബർഗീസ് ഷി വാസ് ഓൾസോ മൈ സ്റ്റുഡൻറ്റ് ഷീസ് നോ മോർ ഷി ടു പി എച്ച് ഡി ഓൺ ദ കമ്പാരിറ്റീവ് സ്റ്റഡി ഓഫ് അയ്യപ്പ പണിക്കർസ് പോയിട്രി ആൻഡ് ടി എസ് എലിയറ്റ് സോ ദ പോസിബിലിറ്റീസ് ആർ ഇൻമെൻസ് ഐ ഡോ നോ രാജേന്ദ്രൻ ഐ ആസ് രാജേന്ദ്രൻ ഇഫ് യു വിൽ ആസ് മീ എനി ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻസ് ഹി സെഡ് ടീച്ചർ അറിഞ്ഞോടാ ടീച്ചറെ ചിലപ്പോൾ ചോദിച്ചേക്കും എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞു ഐ ഡോ നോ ഇഫ് യു ഹവ് ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻസ് കെൻ ഓൾവേസ് ആസ് മീ ഐ മെ നോട്ട് ഗിവ് യു ആൻസേഴ്സ് ജസ്റ്റ് ലൈക്ക് ഏലിയൻ ഡിഡ് നോട്ട് ഗിവ് എനി ആൻസേഴ്സ് ബട്ട് താങ്ക് യു സോ മച്ച് ഫോർ യുവർ പേഷ്യൻസ് താങ്ക് യു സോ മച്ച്